This is Sardinia, the second largest island in the Mediterranean and an autonomous region of the Italian Republic. 1,800 kilometers of rugged coastline open into valleys, mountains and plateaus that hold spectacular beauty as well as history. The Sardinians have fought off invasions from the Phoenicians, Romans, Arabs and Byzantines. Today, however, they must fight a different kind of war, a battle to preserve and protect their environment. From this isolated land have emerged endemic species of flora and fauna found nowhere else in the world. And protecting them in the face of ever-increasing tourism is proving a challenge. Six kilometers off the southwestern coast of Sardinia lies San Pietro Island. Its jagged cliffs, 130 meter high walls and mountainous forms reveal a turbulent volcanic past. But today it provides solitude, calm and protection for migrating birds. Wind, rain and climactic variations have gnawed at this rock for centuries to create a distinctive facade a perfect array of nesting niches that attract birds from all over Europe. The rarest of all is Eleonora's falcon, which only breeds along cliffs like this in the Mediterranean. As part of the Italian League for the Protection of Birds, or LIPU, ornithologist Luciano Durante makes his rounds of the Carlo Forte Nature Reserve. Lipu initially took action on this island in 1981, when poachers crippled falcon populations. Today, Lipu continues its efforts with poachers and tries to find solutions to the birds' falling numbers. San Pietro's uniqueness comes from its geography and geological makeup. Here we can observe Eleonora's falcons close up on these cliffs. That's not the case in other Sardinian colonies. Carlo Forte really is an ideal spot for research. It's a protected species. Very few couples are left in the world, and 2% of them are here on San Pietro. Eleonora's falcon is found throughout the entire Mediterranean region, from the Canary Islands and Morocco to Algeria and Greece. But unfortunately, numbers remain low. Scientists estimate the current population at 4,500 breeding pairs. Every spring, about 120 of these couples arrive here at San Pietro. After their long journey from Madagascar, they nest here from April until October. Unfortunately, the threats these birds face have not disappeared. In addition to poaching, development along the coast, where the birds live, has greatly affected the species' survival. We observe these birds on a daily basis, checking their nests to see when they arrive for the season, how many eggs they lay, how many chicks take flight, and after they're gone, we wait until they return the next year. It's a cycle. For four months a year, I'm obsessed by them. Autumn has arrived, and Luciano observes the fledgling chicks about to make their first journey south. They prepare long and hard, while their parents pack them with food. A good fat reserve means more energy and stamina. Luciano always keeps an eye out for anything that might provide clues about these birds and how better to save them. Their nests, in particular, can be gold mines of information. These are the borre, sono i rigurgiti. By examining these pellets that the falcons regurgitate after they've eaten, we can determine what their diet is. It usually consists of insects, and in this case, we see little insect feet here. During breeding, though, we've noticed they only feed on perching birds. These 
These are sparrow feathers. Queste sono di cul bianco. A small sparrow. Torcicollo. This one's a shrike. Sono tutti passi di forno. All perching birds. E questa dovrebbe essere And di these must be the feathers of the small egret. Questo è uno dei lavori che facciamo. This is mainly how we identify the species they feed on. If we're asked to, we can also analyze the feathers by putting them through a centrifuge and analyzing their DNA. A toxicological study can identify metals that are present. The feathers are actually indicators of pollution in the air. Crisscrossing Europe, particularly through industrialized nations, Eleonora's falcons often show alarming signs of atmospheric pollution. The routes taken by these birds are conditioned by hunting, indiscriminate capturing of all small birds coming from all over Europe. The good health of the territories they cover, the climate and the presence of other animals, in a word, the biodiversity, is essential to the survival of these falcons. You'd think we'd get tired of doing the same thing day in and day out, but it's actually not the same every day, even if we go back to the same place. The light changes, the sun sets differently, sometimes there's a wind, sometimes there's rain, and of course, the behavior of the birds is always changing. We're also protecting a territory of incredible natural wealth, which is definitely rewarding. Thanks to passionate conservationists and scientists throughout the Mediterranean, the Eleonora's falcon is no longer as threatened as it once was. It's classified on the list of rare and endangered species of the world as a low concern. But attention and careful management still need to continue. For now, Luciano does his best to preserve the coastline and the tucked away nests of the Eleonora's falcon. In the northeast of Sardinia, an imposing limestone block lies in a field of granite reefs. Come summer, this beautiful island of Tavolara transforms. An estimated 5,000 small boats carry hordes of tourists to its beaches and isolated coves. This region's ecosystem is under a tourist invasion. In 1997, the Italian Department of the Environment created the Tavolara Punta Coda Cavallo Marine Reserve, which covers 150 square kilometers of water, as well as the region's coastlines. Marine biologist Pierre Pansanis coordinates the scientific activities of the entire area. Today, he heads out into the field for some hands-on observation. Stiamo facendo una mappatura di vari siti, una mappatura di fondali di, di siti dell'area marina. Potente. Right now we're mapping several dive sites to determine which fish species are the most harmed by scuba diving. We've noticed certain organisms are especially hurt by the mass summer influx of tourists. Biologically, it's a really interesting zone. Look at these structures. They're calcareous algae that form a kind of footpath. They're indicative of pure water and the total absence of pollution. Environmental protection doesn't just mean scientific observation. These field excursions allowed Pierre and his captain to keep an eye out for any unlawful behavior that might endanger the ecosystem. For now, the waters seem pretty calm, but overhead it's a different story. Marine birds gather in their hundreds. This is a good sign, because wherever there are birds, there's an abundance of fish below. Our primary goal is a total management of the territory. We need to exercise better control over diving activities by restricting the activities 
and keeping it to a minimum in certain areas. We want to avoid a heavy concentration on any one particular site. Although the site might be interesting from a biological point of view, it also has to be preserved. In short, we've got to find a happy medium between tourism and sustainable development. Pierre uses a transept as a guideline to help count the different underwater species. From one part of this wire to the other, he can accurately note the type and number of organisms he finds. Considered to be the purest in Italy, the Sardinian waters contain an abundance of marine life. Sea anemones and sea fans in a multitude of colors decorate the slopes and provide shelter for schools of fish, in particular, sea bream. There are several species that are protected at the European level. We have the pen shell, for example, a big Mediterranean bivalve which used to be fished for its beautiful shell. They used to be eaten as well. Today it's protected and is finally increasing in numbers. There are lots of fish which tend to disappear as a result of intensive fishing, like the grouper. By establishing a marine reserve and prohibiting fishing in fragile areas, Tavolara looks better and better every day. The pen shell, the grouper, and even the devastated slipper lobster are all recovering well. But every day, Pierre struggles with the delicate balance between protection and recreation. And divers aren't the only ones churning up these waters. Boat anchors tear apart coral and delicate beds of Mediterranean tapeweed. The reserve must enact stricter boating regulations and find ways of controlling illegal anchoring. Thanks to the transept, I can identify the different organisms living at shallower depths, like sea fans, as well as all of the plants living 40 to 45 meters down among the coral. And by doing this several times at the same depth and in the same spot, I get a fairly accurate idea of the concentrations of fish. People must learn to enjoy the natural beauty here, while at the same time preserving its biodiversity. Some tourists carry away sand and plants from the beaches. They've got to be told that it has to stay where it is. This island will always face a challenge in reducing both the direct and indirect effects of mass tourism. But with preserves like this, scientists hope that future generations will continue to enjoy the natural wealth of the region. Mediterranean maquis and coniferous forests drape the lush peninsula of Capocaccia in northwestern Sardinia. Here, in this isolated corner, La Prigionetta Nature Reserve houses a unique breed of animal, the wild equid. The giara, or miniature horses, live alongside Sardinian donkeys grey donkeys and even albino donkeys, as well as wild goats and the pervasive Sardinian wild boar.
Naturalist Carmen Frazee studies these unique equids which have only recently returned to the wild, or more precisely, to their original wild state. These wild horses came from the Giara region. It's a species that made an incredible adjustment to our isolated environment here and its meager resources. Over time, they evolved much smaller than their continental equivalents and developed this protruding stomach. They're the Cavallini della Giara. Cavallini literally meaning mini horse. These endemic equids come from the high basalt plateau of Giara, and today they continue their untamed legacy. But this wasn't always the case. The species has struggled to survive, and at one stage was even wiped out of Sardinia. They were introduced into this reserve in the 1970s, and the colony went right back to their natural wild behavior. Today, they play a vital role in the region's ecosystem. They graze on the dry grass fields and create perfect clearings to control wildfires, a devastating occurrence that plagues Sardinian summers. This is a Centauria orida. It's an endemic plant that's only found here. The way it protects itself from the salty air, the wind and the heat is that it transforms itself into a sort of thorny cushion. It helps keep moisture inside itself. While on her rounds, Carmen also enjoys studying wild donkeys, which are a bit more gregarious. These donkeys are from all over Sardinia. We even have the famous albino donkeys with blue eyes from Asinara. They actually originated from other Sardinian donkeys. Centuries of crossbreeding the grey donkeys led to the emergence of the albino species. They first appeared on the island of Asinara in the northwest corner of Sardinia. Today, no more than 80 individuals exist in total. Even with new colonies like this one, they'll still only reach a hundred at best. We know so little about these donkeys. We really have to go back to historical data to get a better picture of them. They were probably imported by man, like most mammals here in Sardinia. And because of the island's isolation, they gradually became endemic. They acquired their own characteristics and eventually differentiated themselves from other races on Italy's mainland. With numbers so low, mating with family members is commonplace, and inbreeding has taken its toll. Today, these unique donkeys suffer from reproductive problems. While both the albino donkeys and the Giara horses are struggling to survive, biologists hope that newly established colonies will keep their numbers rising, even if slowly. For the Giara horse, several other repopulated colonies now exist on Ozieri Island and the Burgos Forest of Spain. Generations from now, these equids will hopefully return to their once abundant numbers.
In west central Sardinia, the dunes of Piscinas form one of the most extensive dune systems in all of Europe. Mounds of sand 50 to 70 meters high harbor a unique, yet little understood ecosystem, a habitat under attack. Recruiting some talented environmental specialists, Project Life Natura set out to discover how best to preserve and protect the region. Geologist Eficio Cadoni, a member of this scientific team, scours the field looking for clues. What fascinates him most are the structures themselves. These dunes aren't affected by the winds as much. They really have a certain degree of stability, thanks in large part to these juniper trees and their roots. This juniper is at least 200 to 300 years old and has been around since the beginning of this dune system. Even though it seems dry here, these trees can survive harsh conditions. Branches, veins and shoots are still green. The plant is alive. But there are problems here. Tides bring rubbish that litters the dunes' shores, and abandoned mines pollute the waters that run through them. Environmental engineer Mariella Amisani monitors the Rio Piscinas, trying to find solutions to these polluting toxins and return the rivers, and therefore the dunes, to their original state. The problem comes from the fact that the mines were abandoned from one day to the next, without ever being fully closed up. All of the pollution we see today comes from slag, which is the minerals in these underground tunnels that rise to the surface with the water. Mariella and Eficio head to the Piscinas River to check the acidity of the water, a good indication of pollution and the minerals within it. Here's the area we need to look at. We've marked it with a stone. The water is actually clear, contrary to what you might think. But it does have this orange color, which comes from the yellow mud at the bottom of the stream. And the yellow actually comes from iron oxides that rise from the mining tunnels below it. We'll put a pH strip into the water and then wait a few seconds. Good. Now we'll compare the color to those on the chart, which will give us our pH reading. It's 3.8. That confirms our previous data. The situation is pretty stable at this end of the stream. Look, there's some incrustation on these stones. It's all over. It's due to water evaporation. When it dries out, water evaporates and the high levels of sulfates in the water crystallize and get left on the stones. They're iron sulfates. We see it a lot at the end of summer, when it's dry outside. And when water levels are low, when the first rains hit, they'll get washed off and out to deeper waters, and acidity levels will drop. Further upstream, the picture looks different. Mariella discovers lead, zinc and cadmium all metals from the underground mines, in much higher concentrations than deemed healthy. Let's go to another research site. The health of one site often depends on the health of other nearby sites. What happens upstream will ultimately affect what happens downstream. We're now at the mouth of the Rio Piscinas, our last research site. 
The situation of the river is stable right now, according to our recent observations. It's even got better since the acidity fell. It's at 4.6, 4.8. Better conditions in these waters mean a better overall ecosystem. The pollution has disturbed everything in the food chain, from the phytoplankton growing in the water to the schools of tuna that used to swim along the coast. We have to continue to monitor the situation and find solutions to reducing the pollution. The list of possible solutions is endless. But before anything else, we need to close the tunnels which are the root of the problem. Project Life Natura struggles with little funding. But these guardians of nature hope that decontaminating these mines will become the top priority of the region and help to preserve the health of this natural wonder. Between the islands of Sardinia and Corsica lie the crystal clear waters of the Strait of Bonifacio. Made famous in the 1960s by the Aga Khan, the Costa Smeralda, or Emerald Coast, encompasses seven main islands, all rich in life and luxurious beauty. In 1994, UNESCO classified this archipelago, La Maddalena, as a protected world heritage site. Ironically though, it not only holds enormous biodiversity, but handles millions of tourists and houses a military base. Balancing environmental protection with these activities is a huge challenge, especially for biologist Alberto Fozzi. This area is ideal for dolphins like the bottlenose. They like to live near the coast, especially in shallow bays and coves. The females in particular find the environment perfect for raising their young. Alberto is the director of the Dolphin Research Center, and today he and his colleagues set out to make some important observations. Human activities are concentrated in the coastal regions where dolphins hang out. Dolphins compete with fishermen. Boat traffic can seriously harm them. And despite its national park status, no regulations have been established. Saving the dolphins means protecting the entire marine environment, especially from the effects of man. The research team receives word that dolphins have been spotted behind a trawler, and they race off in that direction. The dolphins often approach fishing boats once the nets are lifted on board. They're attracted by the sound of the pulleys, which they recognize. They hear really well underwater. Let's see if we're lucky, if there are some dolphins here. Unfortunately, the dolphins have vanished. With problems increasing, it's becoming harder and harder to spot them. There's also a marine pollution problem as a result of motor exhaust and the dumping of wastewater. And then there's also sound pollution. These mammals base all of their communication on their hearing. Living in a noisy environment is absolutely devastating to them. Summer boat traffic continues to increase each year, and the dolphins decrease. The cause and effect seems obvious, but scientists need to work hard to find proof.
The dolphins here tend to live rather sedentary lives, traveling only short distances and therefore never escaping these polluted waters. Because they live in such a relatively small area, Alberto and his team can monitor their progress month after month. We use photo identification for our research on the bottlenose dolphin. Whenever we see a dolphin, we photograph it and compare the picture with the others we've taken. They usually have very distinctive marks on their dorsal fins, which help us to recognize who is who. So far, the research center has catalogued 92 individuals, each of which Alberto can name. And it continues to identify new dolphins and make startling new discoveries. In cooperation with other research institutions, the Dolphin Research Center has recently found a worrisome accumulation of toxins in the dolphins' tissues. Between August 2002 and October 2005, 20 dolphins washed ashore in Sardinia. All had died from high levels of contaminants. Scientists continue to monitor these waters and observe the dolphins in the hope of preserving them and their habitat. Look, this photo tells us a lot. You can see that it's Zorro. We can't forget that this area is full of military activity. There are nuclear submarines beneath us. I think it's high time we made some decisions. What do we want with this archipelago? To be a military base or a national park? The two activities are not compatible. Our position, of course, couldn't be clearer. It's a delicate balance, a challenge to preserve a natural treasure while satisfying the needs of a country. And Italian conservationists and scientists continually strive to achieve this in Sardinia. Just outside the city of Cagliari, in the south of Sardinia, lies a haven for a special island inhabitant, the Sardinian red deer. The deer used to roam the entire island in the early 20th century, until they became the prize catch of poachers and the deer population crashed. By 1984, the World Wildlife Fund had stepped in. It bought an old hunting reserve in the Monte Arcosu forest and turned it into a preserve. This area now houses over a thousand individuals, over a third of the entire Sardinian red deer population. Only two other regions in the entire world have these deer. A lot of work has gone into this site, and forest warden Nando Sulis is witness to 18 years of it. Poaching used to be really horrible. At one point, there were only 80 to 100 deer left, and 20 years later, there are a thousand. Poachers were really out of control at one point in time. Poachers may no longer be a problem, but dangers still lurk everywhere. These are collar traps that were just put in place. I'm removing them immediately. They're used for capturing wild boar. But unfortunately, any animal coming by could get caught. Deer, foxes, even hunting dogs. It's actually a simple slip knot. When the animal passes by, its foot or neck gets caught. 
And the more the animal pulls, the tighter the knot becomes. If the victim isn't found quickly, it dies a slow and painful death. I can understand why there are so many traps, what with all these boar tracks. The red deer is a subspecies that's only found in Sardinia and Corsica. It's much smaller than the European deer. An adult Sardinian may weigh 130 kilograms. A European deer, 300. It's really small. Nando must also keep on the lookout for wildfires. The cork oak, green oak and shrubs blanketing the forest allow fires to spread quickly. And just one fire out of control could wipe out this deer population. Having worked here for more than 18 years, I've seen astounding changes. We've helped to protect and nurture the forest back closer to its original state. And the deer have consequently increased a lot. Two thousand five hundred deer now reside in Sardinia. The Monte Arcosu colony is one of the largest. And to ensure its continual growth, the World Wildlife Fund creates clearings, guarantees a reliable food supply, and tracks the deer with electronic tags and radio collars. Today, Nando sets out on a mission to count every deer possible. It's a yearly ritual that takes place every autumn at the start of the mating season. Night falls, and the famous bellowing of the males begins as they size each other up and compete for the fertile females. We have several observation sites throughout the reserve. We'll stop here and listen to the bellowing. Once we've heard it, we look at our compass and try to determine the deer's exact location. Since each male has his own territory, we can easily locate each deer. They don't venture out of their territory or they run into a competing male and have to fight him.
For each bellowing male, we count one and a half females. We use these figures to make our calculations of the total population. It's obviously an average. The World Wildlife Fund eventually hopes to create corridors between the deer sites on the island and allow different populations to mix. In the central region of the island lies the Barbagia, the wild heart of Sardinia. The jagged peaks and winding paths on top of the Genagentu Massif have long been a refuge for outlaws, as well as shepherds. They traveled among the dense forests that once covered this now bare landscape. Conservationists like Lucia Coy now devote themselves to the preservation of the land and its ecosystem. Centuries ago, there was a huge forest in this region. But they cut it all down for the Italian railroads in the mid-19th century. It really changed the landscape. This is a hundred-year-old oak that somehow miraculously survived the deforestation. Today, the goal is to replant the area. New plants have been sown, and these tubes actually help new plants grow. This Cajun stake protects the plant from bad weather, but also from grazing animals, which are everywhere. Herds of cattle, as well as wild animals like boar, will devour young shoots. The tube is bent, which is pretty common. Animals easily bend them with their weight as they try to get the shoot sticking out the top. Lucia works to protect not only the plants, but the animals here as well. The Fonny dog has roamed these hills for over a century. Its aggressive nature helped shepherds protect their herds and Mussolini fight his wars. Despite their tough disposition and the difficulty in domesticating them, Lucia still feels these canines deserve recognition as a breed of dog. They're animals with very well-defined characteristics. My job is to find these traits and show they're valuable so the dog will be recognized as a breed, not merely as an endemic species to this region. But time is running out. Only 500 individuals remain on the island. Inbreeding is a major problem. Until recently, the owners of these dogs tended to make them with the funny dogs of their neighbors. Of course, it's a good way to preserve the race, but at the same time, they've ended up with animals all coming from the same family. Plans are underway, which hope to restore the dog population, as well as the forests. But despite being established in 1998, Genargentu National Park still struggles. 
It lacks sufficient conservation programs and needs to gain local support in order to implement them. People hope that progress will soon be made. The guardians of nature here are trying to find a balance to preserve their heritage and beauty while at the same time reaping its benefits. With its rugged coastlines, valleys, mountains and plateaus, the island of Sardinia is a natural haven.